So, last Friday, a week ago Friday, I was here at the church, and I'd been just studying the Word at home, and then spending time in prayer, and then I came here to the church, and it was just one of those days where I just really sensed God's presence on me, like, really strong, okay? It was like, you know, it's like you don't want to do a lot in terms of getting away from just that quiet time with the Lord, because you just sense God's presence in such a real way. And I'd been back in my office working, and and then I just went up to Sharon's office to drop off something, and and I just and when I was t- walking towards her office, I just felt the Lord talk, started talking to me about change, change, a change in the order, changing. And I spoke on that last Sunday morning, and I'm just going to follow up on it again this morning. Okay. So somebody said, "Let me know when you finish changing, you're finished, right?" Some people, they said, you know, they, they died at 40 and they buried them at 95. Amen. What does that mean? It means, you know, that they got to a certain point in their life where they just quit growing, quit learning, quit developing. And even though they uh, maybe didn't pass away for a long time, really they, they died from the neck up or from the spirit up. They didn't really grow in the Lord. So... We need to be always growing, we need to be always developing, and in order to grow, I've got to be willing to change. So if the Lord speaks to me in my life about growth, growth involves change. It not only produces change, you know, when you grow it produces change, but it also is one of those things, in order for us to grow, we've got to be flexible. In other words, if we want things to be different We've got to be willing to do things differently, Amen. right? And that's what people want. They want things to be different, but I don't want to do anything different. Well, if you want things to be different, you've got to be willing to do things differently. You've got to be willing to make adjustments. Now, the first message that Jesus preached while he was on the earth, he preached about repentance, And a lot of times people think of what repentance is, is whenever people are really emotional or people are really um, dramatic or people are very, um, you know, remorseful. And that it can involve all those things. But at its base, repentance is when people just change their mind. Repentance is whenever people just turn their heart and they say, I'm not doing that anymore. And I think all of us have had those moments in our life where we say it was a defining moment because we repented and we thought, you know, I'm not doing life that way anymore. I talked to a person this past week and they said um, when they were 14 years old, they'd been involved in a car accident and they broke their nose. And at, at 14 years of age, they started getting on pain relievers. And they said that took me for about the next uh, 10 years of my life. In other words, what started as a broken nose and pain relievers for the next 10 years of my life, I was, I was really got addicted to prescription drugs. And of course, that led into illegal drugs. And, and he said, then I came to a point where really I just hit bottom and lost jobs, lost reputation, lost a lot. And he said, and it was like, I just thought, I've got to change. I just can't do this anymore. I just can't do this. And he said, once I got sober, and it was like, I just changed. And I talked to him, and I said, well, do you still, he's 30 years of age now. I said, do you still have those desires? And he said, no, I don't. He said, because I know I can't have it both ways. I have a career now, and I know I can't go down both paths at the same time. If I go down that path, I'm going to lose everything that I've worked for. Now, what am I getting at? Change positive change happens when people are willing to repent when people are willing to say this isn't working this isn't working this is crazy I mean no that can happen in a marriage when people realize hey this bitterness this isn't working this silent treatment thing this thing where we get upset at one another and we don't talk to one another for a week on end that doesn't work And all of a sudden, people realize we're going to have to go down a different path. Now, in the Greek, the word repent means to change your mind. 
But you know, in the Hebrew, it's a picture of changing your direction. So it's, what are you going to do different? If things are going to be different, you're going to have to take some different paths. Now, I want to emphasize to you today that many times when God brings about change in our life, it can be a small change that makes a huge difference. In other words, we just say, Lord, okay, I'm going to spend more time in your word. I'm just going to have a devotional life. All of a sudden, because you have a devotional life, it's not that you're having a devotional life to have works for righteousness, but because you have a devotional life, there's fuel in your tank. And all of a sudden now, whenever you have pressure on you, instead of responding like a natural person would respond, you begin to respond to that problem the way the believer should respond. So there are changes that God is wanting to bring into all of our life. Okay, now, I said this last week, I'm going to repeat it. Any change that Jesus Christ is involved in, it's always change for the better. Amen. Amen. You know, somebody say, oh, I got changed, and I'm real religious now. You know, religion, Jesus didn't come to bring religion, Jesus came to bring life. The world's got religion, and the world's miserable. Jesus came to give people life and to give it to them more abundantly. So when Jesus comes into our life, he brings the ability for us to change. Now, grace, when you look up the word grace, there's a lot of definitions. One, when you look at W. Vine's Expository Dictionary, it makes this statement. It talks about favor. And then it goes into another definition, and it says the divine influence on the heart divine influence on the heart in other words God begins to change your heart to where all of a sudden you love the things he loves and you hate the things he hates you want what he wants and you don't want what he doesn't want and that's just a good prayer for us to pray on a regular basis Lord help me to want what you want and help me to not want what you don't want me to want it's not a good sentence but you know where I'm going right Lord help me to want the things that honor you and please you. Okay, but it also gives this statement, W. E. Vine's Expository Dictionary, when you look up the word grace, it means this, the power and the equipping for service. So one of the things that grace does, it is God's favor, it is a divine influence on our heart, but it's also this, it is God's power and it is his equipping for service. In other words, whatever God calls us to do, God will equip us to do it. Whatever life he wants us to live, we can do it because he is the one living in us, helping us to live that life. How I many of salvation is not you pulling yourself up by your hair? It's not you. It's not you through your own, well, I, I did this. See, if you did it, you get the glory. But you see, when God does it in you and through you, and you know he is the one at the end of the day that gets all the glory, it's easy to lift your hand and say, praise God, look what the Lord has done here. So God is the one that's working constantly in our life to help bring about change. Now, what happens is sometimes God is saying it's time to make a change, and we get stuck and we're not pivoting, and we're not moving in the direction that he wants us to move in. For example, you remember when Jesus was on the cross, one of the seven sayings of Jesus when he was crucified was, it is finished. And you say, what was he talking about when he said it is finished? Well, was he talking about the full plan of man's salvation? Actually, the full man of sal plan of salvation wasn't completed until he was raised from the dead, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. What was finished? The old covenant was finished. The veil of the temple was torn, and Josephus tells us, the Jewish historian tells us that veil was about four inches thick, four, uh, 20 inches tall, or excuse me, 20 feet tall, four inches thick, and it, it was torn from the top down to the bottom. And so it was torn, and what happened? He, he, the veil of the temple is torn. It's a picture. Now we have access to God. But you know what happened when you read the book of Hebrews? In the book of Hebrews, did you know that they were still offering animal sacrifices and there was still temple worship going on, even though 
that time, that season, that form of worship had been abolished, but yet in the mind of those Hebrew believers, or the Hebrew people, they were still going to the temple. They were still worshiping. There had been a change, but people didn't embrace the change. Now, we think of the Emancipation Proclamation, January the 1st, 1863. We think of the Emancipation Proclamation. People were set free. Slavery has been abolished. But you understand, even though there had been a change legally, there were people that were illiterate that didn't know about it, or there were slave owners that said, we're going to suppress that knowledge. You're not going to know about that knowledge. We're going to do what we can to restrict your knowledge of that, and because you don't know about it, you can't walk in the freedom that's legally, rightfully yours. Well, it's the same thing. Y'all, in the eyes of God, God's people are free. You're free. So, oh, Pastor, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be free. Well, you'll be more free on some level. But let me tell you, in the eyes of God, you're delivered from the power of darkness right now. You've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light right now. So salvation is right now in your life. Today, if you hear his voice, today is your day of salvation, the Bible says. So what we've got to do is realize that, yes, God has legally given it to us, but you know what? There's a lot of people that live in a lack of knowledge. And the Bible says, my people, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Okay, so here's where I'm at today. I want you to just think about change, and I want you to never be afraid of change because if God brings change into your life, he's not trying to take you lower and lower. We read it last week. God changes us by his spirit, and he's wanting to take us to glory to glory, going higher with the Lord. We're raised up with him and heavenly places and spiritual authority, but yet from an experiential standpoint, God wants us to know what it's like to go from faith to faith, to go from glory to glory by the Spirit of the living God. So, change. What are some things that we can say about change in our life today? Number one, don't be change resistant. You say, Pastor, I'm not change resistant. Somebody said, if you're still mad that they canceled gun smoke, you might be change resistant. Yeah. If you're still mad that they got rid of your rotary phone, you might be change resistant, right? If you're, if you're still upset about, you know, sometimes people, they're, they even come to church and they can be so stuck with what God used to do but let's see what God's doing right now. Hey, you know, whenever I was in college, I traveled with a a ministry, and we traveled all over the state of Oklahoma, and we preached in churches. I preached in churches on Sunday morning. There was a singing group that sang, and then I would preach. And, you know, a lot of these these churches that I went to were what we call classical Pentecostal churches. They were churches that were— at some point we would say they had a heritage or a link to the Azusa Street Revival that at that time had taken place, you know, about 80 years earlier in the U.S. And, uh, and, you know, I noticed when you get in a lot of those circles, a lot of times there was always this reference to what God did, what God did. There was always kind of a, a reference to what God had done in the past, And then there would be kind of a reference towards the coming of the Lord, which, thank God, we should emphasize the coming of the Lord. But, you know, y'all, we can't live in the past, and we're not in heaven yet. We're living right now. And what we've got to do is is we've got to have this passion. We've got to have this hunger to say, Lord, what are you saying to me? What are you saying right now in my life as it relates to change? Help me not to be change resistant help me not to be kind of this person that is really antagonistic to what God is doing it's been said this every move of the spirit every generation that experiences a fresh move of the spirit will fight the previous generation who experienced the move in other words instead of these two groups realizing hey God's just taking us from glory to glory let's not be 
cantankerous with one another. Let's just realize God's doing a fresh work. God is doing a work in our day, and we need to be open to what the Lord is doing. So when I would go in those circles, it was funny because they'd talk about, you know, what God did many years ago. And, of course, I was from an environment, I was going, it wasn't that many years ago. In fact, I was thinking, he's doing it right now. God's working right now. God is moving, and, and God is working by his spirit. Now, let me tell you another problem with you being not real open to what God is saying today in your life is not only change-resistant, but we said this last week, people become know-it-alls. They become Gnostics. They become those people that feel like knowledge, I know it all. And, and the problem when you know it all is you can't be taught. When somebody knows it all, they're not teachable. They're not willing to learn. It's hard to teach somebody anything that knows it all. Now, I'm going to give you a little revelation. Twelve months from now, you're going to know more. If you'll keep growing with God, you're going to know more than you know right now. And there's going to be things that God wants to open up to you. God wants to reveal to you. God wants to show you. And um, it'll help you in that area. You know, I had a person call me. And this is kind of a high-profile person here in the state of Oklahoma. And they called me up and they had an honest question. They said, Pastor, I want to ask you something. You're a pastor. You need to help me with this. When I read the Psalms, I read some of the things that David said. And I don't quite understand that because I think that really, does that really mesh with what Jesus said or what the Apostle Paul taught? In other words, I see some of what David said. He'd get mad at people and wanted to break their teeth out. Y'all remember that? <laughs> and he'd say David would talk about certain things in and, and despair and, and say, you know, he would cry out to the Lord and say certain things. And he'd say, I don't really understand how some of the things David said and how does that really fit with when Paul would talk about things, we're more than conquerors, and we always triumph in Christ. And I, and I just said this, and I said, here's what you got to realize. The Bible is progressive revelation. In other words, there were things that David walked in all the light he had, but David wasn't a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. David did not know. And then people get... Now, here's where the change-resistant part, I'm fixing to show you an example of that. When you tell a group of people, did you know you could have a relationship with God that is more intimate than King David had? When you say that to people, people go, oh, heresy. But I'm going to tell you, if King David himself would tell you, people, you got a better covenant with better promises. So what I'm saying is in the scripture, there's a progression of revelation. There's things that God is wanting to reveal to us, and he wants to take us from glory to glory and from faith to faith, and he wants us to grow in him, and that's why we need to understand what the, the scripture teaches. But you need to read the Old Testament in the light of the new covenant. And let me tell you, right now I'm going through the book of Psalms. I'm going through it for the third time, all of 150 chapters, you know, and I'm getting a lot out of it. But when I see those things, you know, I just know David was an old covenant man that wasn't a new creation in Christ. And he was walking in all the light he had. But we live in a time when the veil of the temple has been torn in two. We have access to the Father. We have a revelation of who we are in Christ. See, in the Old Testament, they look towards the Messiah coming. And in the new covenant people we're looking for his coming but it's the second coming but we're not looking to the cross we're looking back at the cross and we're seeing what he's done in our life okay change when you're finished changing you're finished when you get to the point where you go well i've grown about all that i've grown well then that you're not gonna you're not gonna continue to mature and grow in your christian life now let me just say this. The church has a lot of babes in Christ. Paul talked about newborn babes, or actually 1 Peter talks about newborn babes. And then Paul wrote, and he said, you're still babes in Christ. You see, there's a difference between a newborn babe and a babe in Christ. A newborn babe is somebody that just got born again. This is all fresh to them. This is all new to them. This is all 
revelation of them. But then you have this other group, and they're a babe in Christ. And that's when Paul said in Hebrews chapter 5, he said, The time comes when you should be eating meat, but you desire milk. There's a time that you need to grow up. And you know, not every Christian wants to grow up. Not every Christian wants to get to the point where, well, well, somebody needs to do something about this. And the Lord's looking at you going, and you're just the one to do something about this. You see, there reaches a point where when you're a babe in Christ, you do certain things. And you think, well, we need to get somebody to pray. But you see, as you grow in the Lord, you realize that God hears your prayers just as well as he hears the prayers of any Christian alive. Well, let me get the Pope to pray for me. Can I tell you, Jesus hears your prayers. The Father hears your prayers just as clearly as he hears the Pope's prayers. Oh, Billy Graham. I know he's passed now, but you know, people think, oh, if I get him to pray. Y'all, he doesn't have an inside track with God any more than you have an inside track with God. You have access to the Father. And so these are things that help us to grow up. These are things that help us to mature. So are you teachable? When you say, Pastor, how do I know if I'm teachable? When you see something in the Word, are you going to walk in it? Are you going to say, well, I know the Bible says that, but I have my way, my thoughts about things. And you say, Pastor, people don't really say that. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said this. They have made the word of God to none effect because of their traditions. So you're going to reach a point to where this is the way grandma did it, this is the way grandpa did it, but this is the way the word of God says to do it. I'm going to walk in the light of what the word of God has to say about this. So growing Christian, are you a growing Christian? Well, not really, Pastor, not really. Are you a growing Christian? Think about that. Are you growing? Are you, are you growing in the Lord? You see, if you're a growing Christian, you're a changing Christian. You know, I have at our, in my office, behind the door of my office, I've got these little height marks, you know, and, and I've got, you know, for example, John Paul was this tall when he was this old. And then every once in a while they'll come in there, come on, get against the bout wall here, let me measure you and I'll, I'll mark it off, and I'll mark it off, and I'll mark it off. Well, you know, that growth doesn't happen just bam. Last Sunday, this Sunday, last Sunday they were here, and this Sunday they're six inches taller. You know, It doesn't happen like that. It just happens while they're sleeping. It just happens every day. It just happens. And Sharon makes the comment a lot of times saying, boy, they're eating a lot. They must be hitting a growing spell. You know, you can say that in the church world. When people get to the point where they're eating the Word of God and they're hungry for the things of God, you know what, we can step back and say, they're about to hit a growing spree. They're about to start really growing. But you see, what happens is, as people get to a certain age, say maybe 19, 20 years old, they kind of plateau and and that's it. They they kind of quit growing. That's as tall as they're going to grow. But you see, in our Christian walk, I don't care how many years you've been walking with the Lord. You've been 19 years, 20 years, 25 years, 35 years, 55 years. However many years you've been walking with the Lord, did you know we're always to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, we should always be growing. We should always be maturing. We should always be developing. And I'll tell you what stops it from happening is when people feel like, well, I already know that. Oh, yeah, I know that. I heard a sermon on that. Y'all, did you know hearing sermons will not change your life? It's when we do sermons, that's what changes our life. People say, oh, I know that. I know that. You know, sometimes I watch these cooking programs. If y'all know anything about it, I'm not a really good cook. In other words, the kids would prefer Sharon to cook over their dad to cook, okay? But, you know, I get to watch it. Sometimes, you know, I'll watch one of these cooking programs. I, you know, I think I can do that. 
And how many know they make it look so easy, right? They've already got it all. And I think I could do that. But you know, watching somebody else doing it, there's a difference between them doing it and you living it out. Amen. And sometimes, you know, we get to think, oh, I, I got it all figured. Y'all, we've got to not only be a hearer of the Word of God, we've got to be doers of the Word of God. So just hearing a sermon... It's not going to revolutionize your life. What's going to change your life is to say, Lord, I'm going to do what you said to do. I'm going to live my life according to the word of God. Jesus made this statement. If you will continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. If you will continue, if you'll stick with it, if you'll stay in the word, then you will be my disciples indeed. You see, we have got to stay with God's word. We've got to Stay with the Word of God. So don't be change resistant. Remain teachable. And then here's another thing. When God speaks, you got to obey Him. Now, you know, one time I was praying about something and I was thinking about, you know, there's some sins that just keep tripping Christians up. Paul said, lay aside, talking to Christians, lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. Lay it aside. Put off the old man. Put on a new man. And I heard the Lord say this to me in prayer. You know, people always say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And I heard the Lord say this. I would rather they repent. Isn't that interesting? In other words, rather than just, you know, Lord, forgive me, and I'm going to do it again next week. Go ahead and take care of that one too. And Lord, you know. You know, rather than us having no life change, did you know it's better for us to be willing to just make the change? Okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do life differently. And you say, Pastor, why does God give us marriage? Did you know two are better than one? Because in marriage, and I realize not everybody here is married, but for those that are, do you realize sometimes in marriage you can have a spouse that can help you to realize, hey, I want you to know I'm wanting to improve in this area. I want you to hold me accountable. But not too accountable. No, I'm just joking. You know how you get. You say, now, I want you to hold me accountable, but I want you to be gracious if I mess up, right? And so what do we do? We say, you know, I, I'm, I'm wanting to grow in this area. I'm wanting to develop in this area. Iron sharpens iron. So a man is sharpened by the countenance of his friend. And so you get around, and in marriage, your spouse can give you some objectivity. Now, most of us, if we, if we could see our life through a video camera lens, we would see where we're missing it, right? If we could see our life through the lens of a camera, we could see, okay, I see now where I need to improve. Well, that's basically what a spouse does or a friend does or a church community does. They're able to say, look, I, I can see I'm praying for you in this area. I want to help you in this area you say well Tom are you a better person because you got married now I'm going to be real honest with you before I got married I really felt like I had my act together how many felt like that I did man I kind of I kind of then after I got married I realized either Sharon needs to change or I need to change right well you know I use that in a marriage but also I'm a better person because of my marriage I no doubt about that but can I tell you, it's not just in marriage, but how many know because you're a part of a church family, you'll be stronger in your growth with God? Because you know what happens in church? Iron sharpens iron. When you're in church, uh, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. When you get around other people of like precious faith, you begin to realize, guess what? I need to grow in some areas, and I need to be flexible, and I need to be adaptable. So are you growing? Are you a growing Christian? Are you changing? Are you willing to make changes? Now for me, how does that change take place? It's the discipline of God's Word. I don't read God's Word to get saved. I read God's Word because I am saved. And somebody say, well, why do you read the Word of God? It's like it helps me to get God's way of doing life versus man's way of doing life. 
You realize we live around where everybody's got advice, don't they? Everybody's got advice. I mean, you don't even have to solicit their advice. They're going to give it to you. I mean, you go to the work on your car, you go to the parts counter. I mean, the guy's got, uh, the way I see it is this. And then you go to work. Well, the way I see it is this. How many know it really doesn't matter at all how people see things? It only matters how God sees things. You're not going to stand before the judgment seat of people. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You'll give an account for the deeds done in your body. And the Bible says whether those deeds were good or whether they were bad. You're going to give an account for your life. And so what I need to do, I need to say, Lord, help me. Help me in my life, Lord, to, to as I spend time in your word, you, you talk to me. If you're a growing Christian, hear this, there are some characteristics of a growing Christian. You're going to love the Word of God because, trust me, before you hit a growing spree in your life, you're going to intake the Word of God. You're going to just take in the Word of God. I'm, I'm hungry. You know, our kids at 10 o'clock at night, can I get a bowl of cereal? Do you really want a bowl of cereal? Yeah, just, you know, just a little something. Tie me over. Well, you know, that when, when they're growing, they're, that we realize that. And that's the way it is as, as Christians. We're not just saying, what's the minimum I can get in? What's the, min the lowest level of calories I can get in on the Word of God and still survive? But what can I do to flourish? What can I do to mature in my Christian life? Okay? So, can I say this? You need to grow not just in one area. Did you know God will put us around different people to help us grow in different areas? Yesterday at our men's breakfast, um, Darren Hunt shared how he was on his way to do prison ministry. He said, I stopped at a convenience store. I saw a guy sitting on the, sitting on the curb outside. And I could tell his story, but he could tell it better. So I'm going to let Darren come up here and tell us that story. Because I'm using this illustration, how iron sharpens iron and how we grow in different areas when we get around different people, all right? So tell us, so you're headed to what town? Uh, headed to uh, Helena. Okay. Uh, Helena, Oklahoma, that's where the uh, prison is. And uh, I'm going out, by with, uh, going out through Watonga. And uh, so I'm, I stop at this convenience store. I stop there all the time. And... Uh, so I'm getting out, and I go in, I'm going in, and I see this guy, and he's sitting over there with his couple of duffel bags, and he's on the sidewalk. So I thought, well, I'm going to go in and get something to drink. Oops, that. sorry. Okay. That's okay. I'm going to go in and get something to drink. And so I went in, and um, I came back out, and I went over and started talking to him. And I said, I said, what's going on? I said, are you traveling? I said, I see you got a couple of duffel bags here. And he said, uh, he said, no. He said, I just lost my job. And uh, so I'm waiting on a family member to come pick me up. And so um, I said, um, I said, well, what, I mean, what happened, you know? And he said, well, he just started telling me how his life, how his past was catching up with him and, and different jobs that he'd had. He'd lost like three jobs. And, and so I began to share with him. I said, well, can I pray with you? And so I grabbed his hand. And so then about, the whole time I've got his hand now. And so I began to talk to him and I began to share with him. I, I said, you know, I know what it's like to have a past. And I began to share with him about how I'd been strung out on methamphetamines for 22 years of my life and how I'd spent 12 of those years incarcerated. And uh, he, was just, he was just looking at me, and I could sense the presence of God. You know, the Holy Spirit was beginning to move on, beginning to move on him. And so I said, can I pray with you? And his name was Cody, and I said, he said, yeah. And so I began to pray with him, and I just sensed the Holy Spirit moving. And, and so I prayed with him, and then after I prayed with him, I said, Cody... I said, have you ever given your life to Jesus? And he said, no, I've never done that. And I said, do you want to give your life to Jesus? And he said, yeah. And so we prayed, and he gave his life to Jesus, and it was just an awesome, you know, an awesome experience, an awesome encounter. You know, I believe that people, there's people out there that need to have an encounter with Jesus. Amen. You are the encounter. Too many times, you know, we're, we're just walking by the one. I was on my way to do what God wanted me to do and yeah. what I'm called to do. You could have said, well, man, i got to go do ministry. I don't have time to help right. this guy. That, that is it. And let me say, can I say one sure. thing? 
This is what I believe that God has shown me in my heart. That if we'll sow out in the street, we'll reap in power in the yeah, church. That's good. Amen. So just remember, there's people in front of you every day that have never had an encounter with Jesus. Amen. People that are out there that are lost, listen, they're not walking by faith. They're not, they're not walking by faith. They're, they're walking by sight. They're going to have to see and experience Jesus. Amen. Amen. And you are that experience. Yeah. You're God's man on the scene. On the scene. You are. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Now you say, Pastor, how are you going to weave that into your sermon? You see, just like in school, you had different teachers that taught you different subjects. How many know when you get into a church family, you have different people, and one person will say something, it's like, man, that stirred me up. That stirred me up in the era of evangelism. That stirred me up that I need to, instead of when I walk past the guy that's on the curb with duffel bags, grab my wallet. How many know we need to say, hey, that's a, a harvest field right there. That's somebody that we can reach. Now, why do we need that? You know what happens when you come to church? You get around other people, and iron sharpens iron. You get around other people, and, and you, they say things to you, and you think, wow, that's, that's such a compassionate heart. That's such a, a loving heart. That's such a heart that cares. This past week on Friday was spring break. You know, this past week's been spring break, and on Friday I went out to see Bill Kern, a friend of ours, and he has a farm, and, and he said, get out here and we'll go take care of the cattle, check out on all the cattle. He's got 200 out now. And, and so we are driving around. He was naming them. Well, that one's name, he has, gives names to them. He's like Noah, man. He gives names to all the animals, you know. And that one's called this and that one. And he was naming all the different ones and that one. And be careful about that one. That'll charge you. And, you know, he's... And I thought, my, I thought to myself, now he's not a shepherd, but he is a rancher. And I thought, now isn't that interesting that as a shepherd, we think, does he have a pastor's heart? He has a, a rancher's heart where he cares about these animals. Y'all, if we just had people in the body of Christ that looked at one another, what can we do to help this person? What can we do to be alert to this? This person has a need. This person, get to know people's names and care about people. It will make a difference. Can I get an amen? amen. So, Sue, can you come up here, please? So I come to church this morning. Sue's a retired music teacher. And... Uh, you know, she comes to me this morning, and now I'm using the illustration of you care about Loretta, one of our missionaries. We've been praying for her mother, and she comes to me, and, and I'm just going to say, you know, just small things, but how you reached out to send her a message. Tell her what you did. Would you do that? And I know you say, Pastor, this is a small thing, but y'all, small things can make a big difference, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, this morning, I didn't know that Loretta's mother had passed away. So this is one of our missionaries of 20 years that works in Africa. And i just been felt close to her ever since the first time I heard her here at church several years ago. But anyway, I had kind of been out of touch for a couple of weeks. You know, I was out of town quite a bit. So this morning, she was just on my heart. I knew her mother had been sick, and I knew that she had been taking care of her for a long time. So I just sent her a text this morning while I was getting ready and said, um, how's your mother? I've been praying for you and for her. And uh, she sent back word and said, I guess you didn't know that mom passed away, but I appreciate you caring about us and praying for us. And she went on to tell me that she had an ear infection and couldn't go back to Kenya right now until she gets that cleared up. So uh, just told her that I was looking forward to seeing her. She said she'd be back in June and uh, maybe we could spend some time together. So. You know why I'm using that illustration? I heard a mayor speak at a mayor's prayer breakfast one time. It wasn't the mayor, but it was a guest speaker. It was a mayor's prayer breakfast here in Yukon. And this guy made the statement. And he said, if I were to ask you who won the MVP of the Super Bowl five years ago, 
Most of you couldn't name that person. If I were going to give you, ask you, who is it that won the Nobel Peace Prize 12 years ago? Most of you say, I forgot. If I were to ask you, who was it that, you know, did this great legislation or did this? Who was that? You say, you know, I, I forgot and I don't remember their name. But if I were to ask you, who taught you how to ride a bike? You go, oh yeah, that was my brother or my sister or that was a neighbor. If I were to ask you, who taught you how to play the piano? Or who was it that taught you how to read? Or who was it that helped you in these smaller things? You're not going to name, you don't know the name of the MVP of the Super Bowl eight years ago. But you know that ordinary person who had an impact in your life. So what I want to get across to you today is, y'all... God uses ordinary people to do some extraordinary things in the days that we're living in. And it's not enough that I change, but the fruit of the changed life in me is that I desire to bring change into other people's lives. You know why a lot of people aren't witnessing? They don't have anything to say. You know why some people aren't talking about the goodness of God? Because they're not experiencing the goodness of God. But you know, you say, well, Pastor, how do we get started? You know, sometimes, y'all, we just start going out and we share out of our struggles, we share out of our hurts, out of our difficulties, and as we share and as we care and as we repair other people's lives, guess what? God does something fresh in our lives. Thank you, Sue. And Sue did teach people how to play the piano, just for the record, you know. So, and Sue will tell you, you know, kids come up to her when she's in the public, and they'll go, hey, do you remember me? And Sue's looking at him going, God, please help me to remember this. <laughs> do you remember me, Miss Saunders? I was one of your students. Sometimes she'll go, oh, yeah, I remember you. Now, you know what I'm getting at? Sue could look at her life and say it was just an ordinary day at work. But you see, y'all, it was a day that you impacted another person's life. Don't despise those small things you do. Because, see, when God changes us, you know what God does ask of us? Freely you have received. Why don't you freely give out to other people? Why don't you take a moment and share what I've done in your life? Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. I just thank you today, Lord, for changing growth, development, maturity. Lord, I pray that each one of us in this room would be able to answer that question, are you a growing Christian with an emphatic yes? I'm growing in God's word, and I'm growing in my fellowship with the Father by his Spirit. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that each one of us here today would realize, Lord, that each one of us can have an impact on someone's life. Each one of us, Lord, can touch somebody's life. And Lord, whether it's the Cody that's sitting on the curb of the convenience store or whether it's a missionary that we support that they just come to our mind and we reach out to them just pray father you would just help us not to live self-absorbed lives but father help us to live lives that are poured out into other people father and lord we just want to say today that we are changeable we're changeable i mean no we we are changeable amen we're correctable you know, the world has a sta statement, they're incorrigible in re referring to somebody. They're just incorrigible. They, they can't change. They, they are not willing to make corrections. May it never be said of us as a child of God that we're incorrigible or we're not willing to be corrected. But Lord, we know that whom the Lord loves, he does correct and it's a manifestation of the love of God for you to say, come on, let's grow in this area. Let's mature over here. And Lord, you give us a church body so that we can be inspired by iron sharpening iron. 
We can be inspired by missionaries that talk about the need that exists in India. We can be inspired on a weekly basis, Father. All right, I want everybody, if you would, just lift up both hands to the Lord today and say, Lord, today, I'm flexible. I'm teachable. Come on, raise them up high. Lord, today, I ask you to help me to hear your voice. In the name of Jesus, Lord, speak to me. Help me to understand what you're saying to me right now. Come on, just praise him right now. Praise him right now. Come on, just bless him. Press in, press in, press in. Oh, Father, I bless you today, Lord. You're doing a work, you said, by your spirit, Lord. Father, I just thank you today, Lord, that you're doing a work, Father. Lord, we just praise you. We bless you. Let's all stand to our feet today. You know, just worship the Lord. You say, how does God bring about changes? You just worship Him. It's like that wineskin just gets saturated with God's presence. Would you just worship with us today? So take me to that place, Lord, to that secret place. I can be with you, and you can make me lie. Grab it. Take me to that place, Lord, to that secret place where I can be in you, and you can make me like you. God. Father, I just thank you today for the work that you are doing in all of our lives. You know what the difference between condemnation is and true biblical conviction or a witness in your spirit about change you need to make? Condemnation is just kind of vague. It's just kind of, you're just just gloom, hopelessness. You're just, you're just a mess. How many know that's not the Holy Spirit, right? But see, here's what conviction does, or the witness of the Spirit. It's, it's specific. It's direct. It's instant. It's just that, that's it. Forgive that person. I mean, know what I'm saying? And it's not, oh, yeah, you know, it's not all, it's just, it's just quick. It's precise. It's just 
in my heart, I know what the Lord said I need to do. So I'm asking you right now, just bow your head, close your eyes. Lord, I pray you would witness to the spirits of people, Father. Correction. I pray, Father, that if there is any adjustments that need to be made, that will help facilitate growth. Lord, it's not the work of a man, it's the work of your spirit. And Lord, we just would say today we're open to that, whether it's right now or it's throughout this day or throughout this week. We're just saying we're teachable, Lord. And it's impossible to be taught something unless we're willing to be corrected in that process. And so, Lord, I just pray today, Father, that you would just help us today, that you'll just make it clear, you'll make it concise, you'll make it just right on point that we know that's what the Lord said, this is what I need to do. And so, Father, we just bless you, we thank you today. That, Father, your spirit bears witness with our spirit, Lord. It speaks to us, Father. And, Lord, we thank you that you're a loving Father. You love us enough to protect us. You love us enough, Lord, to correct us. And, Lord, we just thank you today that we're willing, I'm willing, Lord, to make changes. Come on, everybody, one more time, lift up a hand. And just if you're a changeable Christian, raise your hand up. I didn't say if you're a fickle Christian. But if you're willing to make changes, if you're wanting to grow, Father, we just praise you for speaking. I just feel like I need to say this over marriages. Come on, if you want to grow in your marriage, you want things to be better, well, are you willing to make some changes? Father, we just pray today that, Lord, you will work in our lives, that, God, we will be more together, that, Father, we would just be drawn in greater union, Father. A house divided against itself cannot stand, but I just pray, Father, for marriages today that, Lord, what God has joined together, let no man pull it asunder, Father. In the name that's above all the other names in this universe, the name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. All right, I'm gonna just ask you a simple question. How many in this room, every head's bowed, every eye closed, say, Pastor, I fully intend And I fully commit that I am going to be a growing Christian, not the first 20 years of my life, but for all the days of my life, I'm going to be a growing Christian. Raise your hand up if that's you. You say, well, does it matter? Yeah, it matters. You need to be in on this, right? So, Father, we just thank you today for this. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Now we just lift up the other hand and just thank God as a sign of surrender, Lord, we surrender to you father we yield ourselves fully to you i want everybody to say thank you lord that i'm willing to flow to obey to do what you want me to do not my will your will be done lord in the name of jesus that's it father we thank you for it lord We praise you right now. Hallelujah. Let him fill you up right now. Father, we bless you right now. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to remind you, the volunteers, we're going to be here today at 430. If you serve on a ministry team, if you serve in any type of ministry of helps team, 4.30, we will be feeding you dinner, and um, so we encourage you to be here. So any other announcements you can think of, Sharon? All right, if you would, turn around to somebody next to you and just greet them, and if you don't know their name, introduce yourself. We love you. God bless you. You're dismissed.